I think I am live. I am not sure. I just sent a text just to make sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Our Lady of Technology. And Father Leo, you were wearing that beautiful vestment with Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I was praying to her because this is the first time I've ever gone live on somebody else's Facebook page. So thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Mary. All the angels and saints. I pulled out the whole heavenly army on this one. So I am so happy, honored, and blessed to be here with you today. I want to share a little bit about who I am before we get started because I want to give everyone hope that you don't just learn how to pray and you're this awesome contemplative prayer. It truly does take some energy and some effort and I want to share who I am, where I came from before we kind of dive into my prayer journey because it's been from zero almost to a beautiful love affair with God. And I'll start with, my name's Kendra Von Esch. I'm super excited. I used to be a corporate executive in America's corporate life for probably 20 years. And my childhood was all about living the war what the world told me. And I wanna share with you, I'm sure there are some of you who know the Anjali commercial. It kind of goes like, I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan. Never, never, never let you forget you're a man, cause I'm a woman, Anjali. And if you're too young and you don't know what that is, it's online, you have got to, to look it up on your search engine. Just type in E-N-J-O-L-I 1980, I think it is, and it will come up. It's hilarious. But I was 10 years old. Yes, I'm 50 years old. I was 10 years old when that came out. And I was this chubby, brown-haired, you know, tomboy. And I'm looking at this woman with this blonde hair in this corporate suit she can bring home the bacon. She's like waving around a wad of cash in her hands. Um, she'll never let her husband forget he's a man. So she's this sexy person. By the way, she can fry it up in a pan, that bacon. And so I'm thinking this woman is a goddess. And later on in that commercial, she's reading her kids a bedtime story called Tickety Talk. And I myself was just like, oh, that's what I have to be? So at 10 years old, I started my first diet. I was drinking Tab. I don't even know if that exists anymore. It's a diet diet soda that is <laughs> the worst. It's, it tastes so bad. I think you taste it for days after you actually have it, but my dad drank it quite a bit. And I bought through my mother, because I was only 10, uh, my very first Jane Fonda's workout video in a VHS. We did not have DVRs or any of these, you know, Netflix kind of things back then. And I started trying to be this woman at 10 years old. That developed into a, oh, by the way, my mom never bought me those leg warmers, no matter how much I begged her to buy me leg warmers, because I thought that if I had leg warmers, I would be able to work out like the women on that video. Yeah, not so much. So my whole life became a battle with what the world told me would make me happy, what I was supposed to look like, what I was supposed to do for a living, and what was considered success because all I wanted my entire life was for people to like me, for people to you know, accept me for who I was, but I was always comparing myself to other people, trying to be somebody else. I want what that girl has, or I'm not good enough, right? I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not educated enough, I'm not skinny enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not smart enough. 
on and on and on. That was the mantra of my life. So, and I, I'm sorry, I'm down in my basement and I'm in Chicago and it's kind of cold down here. So I'm having this little runny nose moment, <laughs> which is so gross, but thank you for allowing me to do that. So I'm not, you know, dripping down my face here. Okay, so yeah, back to my story. I was the woman and girl who just was so insecure. I constantly was wanting to be something else and thought that the very next thing, like if I lost weight, I'll be happy. If I get these kind of grades in school, I'll be happy. If I get this boy to like me, I'll be happy. And I know many of you can relate to this. And as far as my religious life, my parents, bless their loving hearts, initiated me in the church through CCD, so I did not go to Catholic school, but I was initiated all the way through confirmation. However, I didn't learn a thing. <laughs> I didn't even know what Catholic was. I didn't even know there were other denominations of Christianity. I had no clue that there was like Judaism and Hinduism and all of this other stuff out there as far as religious practices and theology was concerned. I was clueless, clueless. I thought everyone was Catholic, to be honest. So I, I am confirmed as a Catholic, right? And my parents were priesters. I don't know if you know what those are, but they're Christmas Easter goers. We only went to mass during those two times. Never went to Sunday mass. We were always busy. My parents live the worldly life, but they still initiated me on the, into the church. And I'm so blessed and grateful for that. Now, after I was done with CCD, and I was kind of going into college. We weren't even going to Christmas or Easter Mass anymore. And then when I left out of my house after um, I got a job, I wasn't going to Christmas or Easter Mass ever. What do I need God for? Because I believe what the world told me would make me happy, and that's money. And I strived after the career path and I climbed the corporate ladder up to a chief information officer, which is an executive over technology, which I find hysterical because I can't even do a Facebook live on somebody else's page. <laughs> I am not a technical person at all. I mean, but my team, I had a wonderful team always. That was one of the gifts that God gave me was this relationship building skill and mentoring others to help them be the best person that they can be, both in their career, in their lives, period. As a matter of fact, I'm a faith coach now. So if any of, any of you are interested, go to my website, KendraVonAsh.com, and send me a note. Okay, sorry. I had to plug that in there. Okay. I just had to check and make sure we were still good. I have a, just so you know, I have my little phone here just in case anything happens and I disconnect um, or things happen during the break. All right, so you might be asking, well, what happened? How in the world did you leave your executive career to get out there and share as a speaker, an evangelist, an author, a podcaster, a YouTube and social media enthusiast to share the beauty of the Catholic faith and to help others deepen their relationship with God? Well, I'll tell you, let me first share my prayer life. So I believe there was a God. I did. I believe that there was a higher power. I didn't believe that there was, you know, some explosion that, that created the world. And I did have a prayer life. I'm using quotes because it was not a prayer life. I thought that prayers were asking God for things and reciting prayers. So I knew the, the Hail Mary and the Our Father. Um, I used to pray this even up into my 40s. Every now and then, it wasn't a regular every night prayer, but join me if you can. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I awake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. If I should live another day, I pray the Lord to guide my way. Not many people know that last verse, but that's what I would pray, even, even at 40 years old. And then I'd pray the Our Father and the Hail Mary, and then I'd ask God to bless my family, my friends, my cousins, my dog, that kind of stuff. 
But then when it came down to the trials in my life and the silly things in my life, I even asked God to help me lose weight. I asked God to help a boy like me. I asked God to help me get a job and then to keep a job. And even in college, when I was out partying all night long because I didn't study for my test, I was praying to God to help me pass the test. And that, my friends, is not prayer. Yes, you can do prayer petitions. You should always ask the Lord. But that's not a true prayerful relationship with God. And so, again, you're asking, how in the world did you get back to the church? So my father um, had a quadruple bypass surgery out of the blue. I had no idea what was going on. And the very next day when I got the call, he was going in for that surgery. He had no symptoms. And I felt so helpless that it was the first time that I actually prayed for somebody other than myself. I honestly got on my knees. I was pretty scared. It was a shock. And it, within hours, he was going to be having his chest broken open and this incredibly intense surgery. So I prayed to God, Lord, please don't take my dad. Please don't take my dad. And tears, it was so heartfelt. And the next morning, the surgery was wonderful. His recovery was fantastic. And I was one of those nine lepers that never went back to thank God. I didn't even think of God. I just said, hey, it's so cool. My dad's um, healthy and he's back on ice skates at the age of 70. And then I looked at my husband and I said, okay, my holy trinity was me, myself, and I. It was all about me. And I looked at my husband and I, and we were both kind of packing on like 15 extra pounds. And I said, look, that could be us in that hotel or the hospital hotel room. That could be us in that hospital. And we even have symptoms. So, honey, I found a diet book. It was actually a cleanse book, which is quite different on Dr. Oz, and I think we should do it. So we agreed. I don't know how I got him to do it with me. And inside the diet book, on one of the pages, there was this pie chart with little segments of your life. And one of those pieces of the pie said spirituality. And I interpreted that as religion. I didn't even know that there were all these new age spiritual things going on out there. I didn't even think again, God and all that spiritual stuff, I don't need it. I'm, I'm going to live the way this world told me, lied to me, that was going to make me happy and successful. So we go on this. Oh, and at that time, I looked at that pie chart piece and said spirituality. And I said, okay, wait a minute. I got nothing, nothing going on in this piece of the pie. How funny that God, in that moment of my prayer for my father, I asked him into my life. I said, Lord, please help my dad. And I opened that door just a little bit. And he wasn't going to take that for granted. He kicked it wide open and came to me in this book. And as I'm reading, I see the spirituality piece of the pie. And I say, you know what? I'm going to go to church. And I'm going to like cleanse my body and I'm going to cleanse my soul. That was a decision that I made <laughs> out of the flu. And so my husband was all freaked out. My family was freaked out. I told him the night before I was going to go and I went to mass for the first time in decades uh, in Easter of 2013. And I walked in all by myself and my parents, you know, everyone was looking at me, my whole family, all fallen away Catholics for the most part, asked me where I was going to go to church. And I said, oh, I'm going to this like Bible harvest church place. You know, it's like this big box church. And all my family said, but you're Catholic. Why are you going to that? And I was like, well, I don't know. I don't, you know, I'm, there's police officers direct in traffic at this church. You know, so, I mean, it's got to be good. It must be fun in there. I wasn't really going to do anything. I It was just a, a decision that God put on my heart and I took. I took a, I said yes, and I went. So 
bottom line, my whole family talked me into going to the Catholic Church, and I'm so grateful for that. So I walk in scared to death, and I haven't been to Mass in decades, and I've only been with other people in my family. And so, long story short, I just want to say, if you want to get into the, to the story, not to plug this, but it's Am I Catholic? It's my story, my book. It's super short. But if you do happen to buy this, a, a book that you can hand on, please, please hand it on to someone in your life who you want to come to the church. Someone just like me, who doesn't need God, certainly doesn't need that Catholic faith, because it's, a, it's, it's written for you for hope, but it's written for them to be real. And how I finally found through the Catholic Church and its beautiful sacramental graces, true transformation, a healing from my addiction to marijuana, my life has changed full peace full joy full love and, ex and acceptance and detachment from the world that i never knew was possible okay i walk into church i'm scared to death it was a crazy story i can't get into it because i don't have too much time today but let's just say i walked away lighter i felt pretty awesome after going to mass even though I made some mistakes so I'll share one with you the father the priest goes up to the top of the altar turns around and says you know peace be with you and I'm in the back row saying oh I know this one and also with you like I belt it out and I'm so proud because I know this response and of course as you know Nobody else is saying that. So if you're watching this and you haven't been to mass for a while, just know that they say, and with your spirit, that is the response. Okay, so I leave that day, but before I leave, I heard the announcements that the priest was telling everyone. And it was all about Divine Mercy Sunday and that confession would be held on Divine Mercy Sunday. And I was thinking to myself, wow. As a matter of fact, I had a, a very bizarre thing happen to me. Everyone around me in my peripheral vision kind of disappeared. And I was all by myself with my thoughts. I wanna say with God, thinking about confession. And I thought, wow, how long has it been since I've been to confession? Like carry the one and I, you know I figured out it was like 26 years since I had been to confession and I also know that I had many many mortal sins on my soul and even some mortal sins that I didn't even know were mortal sins at the time but as I sat there it was the first time ever that I felt a, a sense of silence and reflection my whole life I was never silent. Silence scared me, quite frankly. I would walk into the house, I would turn on the radio, turn on the TV, I even sleep with a fan for white noise. Silence and being with my thoughts is something that I just never did. So sitting for that moment, having all of the humble and jumble of people leaving mass around me be gone, and sitting with the fact that I could die when I walk out of here. And if I do, and I believe a half of a half of a half of a mustard seed of this Catholic faith, I'm going to hell. I'm driving the bus and I'm picking up half my friends on the way down. Like this is not good. But I didn't decide to go. I just, it just was a moment of reflection and almost clarity that, hmm, you know, your soul isn't that clean there, woman. And this is my first time back to Mass. And so I come back because I felt lighter the next Sunday. And it was a beautiful day in Chicago. We don't get many of those up here about that time of the year. So my husband asked if I would go golfing with him. And after Mass, I get, you know, get in the car and I go. And by the way, I am in so much stress with my career. Um, three different companies are merging together. And there's only going to be one CIO standing or one CEO or one whatever other, you know, position. So I was not sleeping. 
I was grinding my teeth. I had such pain in my neck. I couldn't even like move my neck. And of course, golfing in the position where you look down at the ball was not helping my neck at all. And so after the third hole, I told my husband, look, I've got to go lay down. I can't handle the pain in my neck. So I went home, laid down. My two doggies were next to me. And out of the blue, God almost screamed. I didn't hear the voice audibly, but in my head, it was so loud because I was just laying there. Uh, confession at two o'clock after Spanish mass. That's what I remembered from the announcements. And I was like, where in the heck did that come from? And I, I thought, wow, maybe I should go. I mean, maybe it'll make my neck feel better. I don't know. I'll give it a shot. And I roll over. I look at the clock and it says one o'clock. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can make it. Well, I got up, I grabbed a pen and an eight and a half by eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And I started writing and filling it out and then I flipped it over and I started filling out the back side and then the other side and the whole thing was filled out and I don't have really big handwriting. So I folded that thing up and I shoved it down deep in my purse and I went not having a clue where to go, what what the confession looks like. I remember from the movies, there's supposed to be these big brown boxes. And again, in the book, the confession story is so much longer. It's hilarious and very emotional. Um, I was like a, <laughs> I was like a total fish out of water, but I went and I remember this only from the movies. I walked in and I remembered, oh, bless me, father, for I have sinned. It's been X amount of years since my last confession, but I'm so nervous and I'm completely expecting him to yell at me. I mean, I got a lot of stuff on this paper. I'm totally ashamed of what I've done and I'm going to be saying this out loud and I haven't gone to confession for 26 years. I don't even remember how this goes. So I kneel down, trying to make light out of the situation. And so I say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Get a load of this. It's been 26 years since my last confession. And he says in the most beautiful voice, welcome home. And it was at that moment that I knew that that was a loving God that I was in that room speaking to. It wasn't a judgmental father who was going to yell and scream at me, that he loved me for who I was. And all of a sudden, the tears, just like they are now, just drip, drip. I mean, it was like somebody turned on a faucet. The lump in my throat was so big that I couldn't barely talk. And now my tears are filled with, with, my eyes are filled with tears. The paper and all the ink is blurry because it's just coming down, drip after drip, drop after drop. And I could just hear, because I can't speak. It was amazing. And I finally got through everything. And he was such a beautiful soul on the other side. I felt so loved. And then when it came time for the um, absolving me of my sins, I had this incredible, supernatural, out-of-body experience. He was absolving me of my sins, and I was like resting in the spirit on my knees. I couldn't feel my body, but I knew that, the, the, that God was pouring into me. I knew I was kneeling. I knew that I was there, but I couldn't feel anything, and I couldn't move. And then I kind of came out of the back of my head a couple of, like, I don't know, a foot or so. And I, to this day, can picture exactly, like it's a Polaroid in my head, what it looked like. My shoulders shrugging, my hot pink pullover, and my hair pulled up in a clip. Everything, what the, what the kneeler was like, all of it. And it was only for a few seconds, but the love and the peace... And honestly, the joy, I was filled with God's spirit to the brim. I was amazed at how I felt walking out of there. It was definitely supernatural because I could have taken all the drugs in the world, and I've had many, and all of the alcohol, shooting them all down, and never felt what I would almost say was like ecstasy in that moment. And so 
Oh, and I have to share one more thing. I'm in there blubbering like a lunatic and there isn't one tissue. <laughs> There's not one Kleenex anywhere for me to use. So when I say that I, I realized and I could see every bit of the detail, I could see my snots and my makeup on the side of on the side of my um, pullover because I was I had nothing else to do. I didn't know I just used my shirt <laughs> like a child. So when I got out of that church, I floated out of there. And by the way, I was the first one in line because I got there early. And it's Divine Mercy Sunday, and I don't even have a clue what that even means at this point in my journey. And I, I don't know how long I was in there. I must have been in there for 20 minutes, maybe 30. And the line was all the way down the church, out the narthex, around the corner outside. And I was, I'm sure I looked like a mess, right? I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they think I murdered someone. So I just shot out of there as fast as I possibly could. But when I got into my car, I turned around and I looked at that church. And I said, what was that? What was that? That was God. Is that what they call a sacrament in the Catholic Church? I don't know what that, because of course I didn't know anything about Catholicism. I didn't know what a sacrament was. I didn't even know who Jesus was. I just thought Jesus was God's son, not God himself. Don't even get me started on the Holy Trinity. And I did not know why he died for us. This is how catechized I was. So when I sat there and I looked back at that church, I knew, I knew that God existed. And it changed my life. The Holy Spirit put this unquenchable thirst to figure out what this Catholic faith is all about. And so I started on my journey looking up all this stuff. But the first thing that I wanted to do after I started down my journey was to understand who is God? And I would be looking at people who would be in right before mass or they would be so reverent during mass and at this point in time i've never read the bible i'm not even sure what mass is i'm just going every sunday and i'm not really understanding why i'm there i know that i and i need to be in a state of grace because i learned that by the way on my first easter i received the lord and then i went to confession and get this that week i had god filled in me so much that i made an appointment with a priest my second week on the journey, I'm now meeting with a priest. What is going on? <laughs> Talk about a massive reversion. And so I was so desperate to be like those people who would just sit in silence and who would pray and who would be just gazing at the tabernacle in church. And then I found out about the, um, the chapel, right? and Eucharistic adoration. And you could, in some churches, you had, had a chapel that you could go into. And I was, you know, I remember the first time I went in there, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what I should do. And I think that that's a struggle for many people is what is prayer? And prayer is truly, I wrote an article, my most recent one on Catholic Stand, what is prayer? total God moment because I wrote that before I was, was even asked to come on to this conference and speak to you about prayer because I know how many people are struggling with prayer right now. So many people are struggling with a lot of stuff right now. Sorry, I, I get a vibrate and I just want to make sure it's not my partners on the other side. So let's, let me see how much, I just want to make sure that I don't go over because I can talk as you can tell. Okay, let's, we'll, we'll talk about prayer. What it is. Prayer is lifting your heart to God. It is a beautiful time to be with him, to love him and to praise him and thank him. And of course, yes, to ask for things in your life and to pray for others. 
This is really about intercessory prayer, but I didn't know how to pray for anybody else. I just wanted to learn how to pray myself at this point in my journey. And by the way, prayer works. My mother has been praying for me for years. It wasn't to come back to the church. It was just to take care of me. I was a party animal. I was living the, the fast life in the corporate world. And I know that she wasn't real thrilled about that. She knew that I was addicted to marijuana. She knew that I was just living life on like level 10, maybe 11 all the time. Go, 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 go. And she was a little bit concerned and prayed for many, many years. And you don't need to know how to pray. You just need to call out to God with your heart. So prayer, my friends, is a gift. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it's a gift from God. So if we can approach prayer, which is truly a conversation with the Lord, and we can lift our hearts to him in humility, just like it says, we do not know how to pray like we ought. We hear this in the Bible. So Lord, please help me. Holy Spirit, please come fill me with your love, with your peace. Fight the distractions, deliver the distractions around you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce the spirit of distraction, the spirit of confusion. Whatever other feelings that you're feeling, renounce them and command them to go to the foot of the Holy Cross for Jesus to pour his precious blood on, on you and to receive your sentence. I've gone through the book Unbound for Deliverance. That's a recommendation. Um, I've also uh, read Father Ripperger's um, Deliverance Prayers for the Laity if you want to know how to deliver these spirits because there's power in Jesus' name. And it's not us, it's Jesus. So when you're feeling these moments of distraction and anxiety or you're just feeling spiritually slothful, that's what I'm hearing from a lot of people right now. They just don't feel it. They're not feeling the presence of God. Maybe they're angry and frustrated. The world is a mess right now. And nothing, my, my dear friends, should take away your joy. And your joy to be with God. And your joy to spend that time with God. Because it's also, prayer is a covenant this is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Prayer is God coming to you just like Jesus did to the woman at the well and asked her for a drink. He is thirsty for us. He thirsts for us just like he said, I thirst on the cross. I desire my children to come to me, to pray with me, and to look at me as their living water. So it's that covenant relationship, this, this love affair, where we should thirst for God. But all too often, we rely on ourselves in life. We rely on ourselves to give us our own drinks. And that is so disappointing to God. But let's really look at what the purpose and the meaning of life is. It's number one, to love your God with all your mind, your heart, your soul, and your strength. And that means making a commitment to spend time with him. Love is not a feeling. So a lot of people right now are not feeling it, right? I don't want to pray. I'm being lazy. I'm just, I'm too busy. That's, by the way, a sin too. Being slothful can also be, I'm too busy to pray. Not just being lazy and laying around and watching TV instead. So we choose to love God. Love is a choice. And we are called, it is right and just for us to worship the Lord. Not just on Sundays. If you want a true relationship that is supernatural and spiritual and emotional and intense 
And if you want the Lord to be calling to you all day, every day, and vice versa, that you just take his hand and together you live every day in that moment, if you want to pray all day, every day, incessantly, as St. Paul tells us, you've got to build that love for God. And in the beginning, it's us. It is us. I'll talk about the second, at the second talk, I'll talk about the nine levels of prayer. Yeah, there are nine. Can you believe it? I'll just talk to you about the first two right now. One, the first one is vocal prayer. And vocal prayer, as you know, is the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the prayers that are written out for us that we, that we recite. And sometimes we just say them. How many times have you been in Mass praying the Our Father or the Creed and the words are just coming out of your mouth because you're not like thinking about them, you're distracted with something else? And by the way, prayer is the most important and beautiful prayer, Mass, is in our lives. And we block graces if we are not in the right disposition when we walk into Mass and we receive the Lord. I'm not looking down my nose at you, by the way, because I've been there, done that. I mean, I've slid into Mass after the first, you know, <laughs> opening hymn, and I'm like, okay, Lever, just get, did anybody see me come in late? And I've had my distractions throughout Mass, thinking about other things. I can't quite get into the Mass. I receive the Lord just as it's, you know, habitual. Being a daily Mass goer, sometimes we take advantage of the Eucharist. But that's when we block, we truly block the graces from God. And by the way, when we're praying before receiving the Eucharist, we should be saying to God, Lord, I am offering myself here along with you on the, on the altar to the Father. I'm giving up my worldly desires. I am yours. I am your vessel your pottery right you mold me into whatever you want me to be and then our guardian angel walks up with us to receive the eucharist and is sometimes bringing no petitions our guardian angel is supposed to bring our petitions up there so that's the time when we can do some intercess intercessory prayer and pray for those in our lives that are sick that are ill that don't know God, who are walking through this world in darkness, who are broken, who are angry, who are our enemies, who have attacked us. That's a beautiful moment to bring up prayers for other people and intercede for those in your life and even those who you don't know. You can offer your Eucharist for those. Let's not waste this beautiful opportunity to go up with our guardian angel and offer all of our petitions to the altar as our offerings and our petitions. It's so beautiful. But sometimes we're not in the right frame of mind. And I don't think many of us truly understand that we are blocking these beautiful graces that God is so... <laughs> wanting to give us. No one is more generous than the Lord. So think about that the next time you're ready to go to Mass. Go a little bit early. I read the daily readings before every Mass. And I also pray mental prayer over those scriptures. Something in the readings jump out to me. Could be in the Psalms, could be in the Gospel. First, first reading only during the during the week or the second reading on the weekend or on Sunday. Sometimes it's the alleluia. I mean, something is jumping out to me and then I sit in silence. And by the way, the second level is mental prayer. But I forgot to say after loving our God with all our mind, body, soul and spirit, it's number 2, loving thyself and thy neighbor. Sometimes we're pretty hard on ourselves. And we can't love ourselves if we don't have God and his heart. We ask God to purify our heart, to cleanse our heart, because that is where our thoughts and our actions and our words come from. 
Every day we should be praying for the Lord. Pure, give me a pure and clean and contrite heart. Contrite. I'm humbly asking you to help me with all of my sinful ways, with all of the vices in my life, and also with forgiveness of others and myself. So I have two and two. The first two are love thy God with all thy mind, soul, strength. <laughs> number two, loving yourself and your neighbor. Because you can't do number two if you don't do number one. It's not possible. We can't love like God unless we ask him to change our hearts. Then the two first levels of prayer, one is vocal, which we recite. And they can be mental prayer, by the way. You can meditate, Christian meditation, by the way, on those prayers, but many of us don't. And the rosary is one, right? How many of us just check the rosary box every day? By the way, I am working on an audio file. It's going to be called The Rosary for the Distracted Person. So stay tuned for that. But the second level is mental prayer, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the second part the second talk because it's really important it's imperative for us to incorporate mental prayer and so many people I know because I've surveyed thousands of people and the same responses consistently come back you're not regularly scheduling prayer you don't have time you don't know how too many distractions you can't keep your mind quiet and you don't know the purpose. Why am I doing this? So when I go back, I just want to check the time here. Okay, let's go back to my journey. When I was, you know, learning about the faith and I was attending mass, I wasn't praying the mass. Um, I was going to confession because I was falling a lot. I was relying on myself to change. The more I learned the teachings, God would basically lead me to the truth and I would have to struggle with changing myself and I had to change so much I was like oh my gosh how am I going to change all of this everything about my life not just what I'm doing but my beliefs and what I say and what I think I mean this is this is overwhelming and then I heard on the radio about humility and the beautiful aspect of Humility being the basis of all of the virtues. And when we don't know how to pray as we ought, or when we can't change our lives on our own, we must go to God humbly and ask him to help us. And this is where I needed his help. Lord, I hear all these people saying that you just got to do God's will and hear his voice. Well, I have no idea how to do that. And so I took the first step. And in the first parts of those nine levels of prayer, we are the ones that need to move. We have to make the commitment. We have to put forth the effort. But when we raise up on those levels, God is the one that pulls us to him. You want to pray. You want to be in that beautiful moment of pure love and peace. And that just oozes into the rest of your day. And so for me, that's my ministry. My ministry is all about helping others deepen their relationship with God and the Catholic faith. Because I didn't just rely on God to help me. I relied on Mary, St. Joseph, all the angels and saints. I read about saints, like who better to learn how to pray than by some doctors of the church, like St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Francis de Sales, St. Alphonsus Liguori. And I wanted desperately to have that connection with God and not just a connection, but that relationship and love affair where in my happiest times, my normal blah times, and in my trial times, I'm constantly talking with him. 
I'm constantly calling out to him. And that's that, that prayer that St. Paul says where we pray incessantly. That could be just thanking him for the small things. Thank you, Lord, for having me be here today, for having me engage with people through this beautiful technology. Thank you for the internet. Thank you for Facebook, even though sometimes we, <laughs> we're not all that happy with Facebook, but right now we are. Thank you for Facebook. Thank you for this community that decided to come together and we're all listening to our hearts and we all are trying to deepen our love for you. We want to pray for you and we want to pray for others. And along my journey, I had started to go to a prayer group. Now, most of my journey, now think about it, 2013 wasn't that long ago. So almost for five years, I was sitting in the back pew, not talking to anybody, not going to any church or parish events. I was just learning everything on my computer and on my own. And then I got a spiritual director, and then I went to a prayer group for the first time. And I was like, oh my gosh, here we go, you know, just pray the rosary. And I was exposing myself to all these other people, men and women, who were in this prayer group. And it was really quite awesome knowing that these, I was in this place with everyone praying the rosary and meeting spiritual companions on the journey. There's there's something to be said when you pray with other people. There's, there, you know, when two or more are gathered, I am in the presence. And so that was, that was pretty awesome. And so people would always be saying, oh, well, we, can we pray for so-and-so? Can we pray for so-and-so? Um, and then I would share something that was going on in my life. And someone would say to me, I'll pray for you. They had this prayer rope program where everyone would just put in their prayer petitions and this whole praying for other people thing was new and I found myself not doing it so good like someone I'd I'd be talking to them and they'd be like oh yeah I'm struggling with xyz and I'd be like oh okay I'll pray for you and then I'd leave and I'd forget and maybe like a week later I would remember that person but I wouldn't remember their name or their kid's name or whoever I was praying for or the, the full situation and I would just say, okay, God, I just want to pray and I hope you wrap your arms around this person that I saw that, you know, you know, God, you know everything. So yeah, intercessory prayer in the beginning for me was foreign. As I was learning how to pray on my own, I wasn't really quite sure how to pray for other people and if it even mattered, right? Prayer is so powerful in your own life but also so powerful for others and the world. I am sure at this time, many of us have prayed many a rosary for America and for the world and for the situation that we're in, for the evil that is running rampant all over the place and we can see it plain as day, calling out to our mother, calling out to Jesus, maybe sacrificing and fasting a little bit we'll talk about that and how that actually should need and should and needs to be incorporated into your intercessory prayer after the break but prayer is so vast and I think sometimes we complicate it so much and we think we have to do it a certain way or it's not good enough that record of not good enough happens in our spiritual life as well. So let's just remember that prayer, I got a couple minutes left. Let's summarize prayer. Prayer is a gift. It's a gift from God, just like faith. Prayer is a covenant. It's a deep thirsting for one another. And prayer is communion. I don't think I mentioned the third part in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, but it's communion. It's this beautiful relationship, this beautiful love affair with one another. And that comes from the heart. God knows if we're praying in vain. If you are not humbly asking the Lord to help you pray as you ought before your prayer, and you're just checking the box, he knows he knows, and that prayer is in vain. 
If we don't truly pray from the heart, which is why I always ask God before I pray, not only to humble myself, right, in humility to ask to help me pray as I ought and ask the Holy Spirit to fill me, Lord, please give me a pure, clean, contrite, loving heart. I want to enter into this time with you and truly enter into this time with you to love you, to worship you, to praise you and to thank you because it's all about you and everything in my life including my life is because of you so he truly deserves prayer time and always and everywhere through the day to be thanking him and calling out to him in our weakness Okay, everyone, I love you all. Um, if you have any questions, I believe that you can add, put them in the comments. But in the part two, I just want to let you know that I will be stopping a little bit early so that I can ask any questions. I don't know if I can see the comments on here anywhere. Um, make this a little interactive if possible. And I will see you after the break. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to log off now. God bless you.